this is going to put a little bit of a shock into the into the project management community, I think. But in August, we decided to ask ask and explore um, project success rates. And you know, the purpose of the survey was to actually find find out how we define success because there's no there's no official definition. We haven't come to any sort of consensus. And frankly, nor should there be a consensus on success because success is conditional upon the situation you find yourself in. So one of the, a very serious challenge that we've had in the, in the IT community over the last decade is we've been told that we have a very low success rate. So if you read the, the, you know, the generally accepted success rate in the IT world right now is 34%. So when an agile team claims value, they've actually given it because they've delivered working software on a regular basis. Every iteration, they've got more working software to show. And this is a beautiful thing for several reasons. First, it keeps us focused on high value activities. Second, we can actually claim real status. We can show people concrete results for their money. The stakeholders love that. They can see and they give us some money, they get some software. Give us more money, more software. More money, more software. They start cooling in that, ooh, maybe giving those Agile people money is a good idea. Funding the Agile team is a good idea. I fund the traditional things and they give me documentation and they ask me to come to reviews and I sign off on stuff and they tell me to go away for months and then eventually they eventually come back to me and ask me to, to do a user acceptance test and by that time I've spent so much money I can't possibly sign up, I, I have to sign off on it because it looks stupid otherwise. Right, this is one of the big lies in the traditional community, acceptance testing. What a load of crap that is. You know, how can anybody turn down, you've know, burned through a couple million dollars on a project, and you go to your users and say, well, after spending two million dollars, I want you, to, you know, now you're going to do some acceptance testing. What do you think the answer is? It's going to be, yeah, of course I accept it, because they know full well they're going to get fired if they don't. Right? It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Right? So in the Agile community, we don't run into these sorts of problems because we're showing them real progress on a continuous basis. And they like that. I don't know why, but they like that. We have daily stakeholder interaction because we're building a system for the stakeholders. They're the experts. We should get money, you know, we should get information. We need to get information on them. We need them to, to make decisions. So in XP, they've got this practice called on-site customer where they, you've got somebody on the team you know, from the business side of things that can give you information and make decisions in a timely manner. Timely being right now. Okay? I don't have to wait for several weeks to find out what the color of that button is going to be. Make a decision, tell me what you think, you know, what you think the quality of that decision is, and then I'll decide whether or not I want to you know, make that button blue or red or if I want to wait for you to go off and get consensus you know, from the 50 people you need to get sign off from on the color of a button. Right? Let's, you know, let's deal with your, I don't have to wait for all the, you know, whenever you're waiting, that's when wastage um, and, and ineffectiveness gets into the process. In Scrum, they've got this concept of product owner who is the sole person responsible for the requirements backlog and the sole person that, you, that the development team goes to. In Agile Modeling, we've got this concept of active stakeholder participation, which is on-site customer, plus we put them to work. They're the business people, right? So let's get them doing business modeling. Let's get them, you know, figuring out how to how to develop the user interface. Let's put them to work. Let's work with them closely. And you do this with user-centered design techniques by using inclusive tools such as whiteboards and papers and stuff and paper and stuff like that, instead of these complex, you know, complex tools that nobody can use other than maybe a few of us. Uh, and then continuous integration. We compile, we retest, we style check the code, you know, you know we, we uh, on, a, on a regular basis, you know, several times a day, hopefully. Um, better yet, if the code changes, as soon as you check it in, you should automatically recompile, retest. I want to if, if I broke something, I want to find out right away and fix it right away. Let's reduce, you know, by reducing the feedback cycle, uh, we reduce the overall cost of developing the system. Beautiful thing. Now, this is not the full picture for specification, nor is it the full picture for validation. I'll talk about these things later on. I just want to put that in your mind, right? Because we're not, you know, detailed specification is just on a basis that's great, but you can't think everything through in the form of tests. Sorry for the agile religion people out there. And you can't validate everything using tests, doing test-first development. Because you're effectively doing what's called confirmatory testing, testing to your understanding of the specification, of the requirements. Phenomenally huge assumption 
that your stakeholders understand the requirements. Huge assumption, which will burn you every single time because we know it's wrong. So you need to go beyond that. So I'll, I'll give you that, uh, that story um, in a few minutes. And this is also called behavior-driven development um, for the people who are more specification-oriented as opposed to validation-oriented. Um, I personally prefer behavior-driven development, but marketing-wise, it never took off as a term. So. So, but from a requirements point of view, we work in priority order. Each iteration, we go to the top of stack, and we, so if it's a two-week iteration, we pull two weeks worth of work off the top of the stack. So if it's a prioritized list, and we're always working the highest priority stuff, we're always providing the highest return on investment possible. We're always spending the money wisely. Stakeholders like that for some reason. Don't know why, but they seem to like that. By producing and by you know by working on producing high quality working software each iteration, we're get, we're showing them um, actual concrete results. They can see what they're getting for their money. They like that too. We let them change. We let them change the requirements because if something's still on the stack, who cares? I'm gone to it yet. You want you want to reprioritize things? I don't care. I'm gone to that work. No big deal. You want to add stuff on the stack? Great. I'll get to when I get to it. No big deal. Want to take stuff off the stack? Great. Hey, maybe I'll get to go on vacation at some point. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, so this is a beautiful thing. And you start getting people in private, you start asking them, what are you doing in the real world? Well, apparently, almost 80% of them are doing some upfront modeling. Even though an hour ago, on some of the list, they said, oh, we don't do any upfront modeling, that would be evil. Oh, we don't do that, they design upfront, bad, bad, evil. That's against the religion. We'll be, you know, Kent Beck will come along and crucify us at the stake if we possibly do any sort of modeling at all, right? We've got the courage to do everything tomorrow. Oh, okay, it's nice, but it's not what's happening. We are, in fact, modeling. 93% are doing whiteboard sketching on a regular basis. 66% are doing paper modeling on a regular basis. We're doing this. Now, the case tool stuff I question, because I think people are using Visio and PowerPoint to do pretty diagrams, but um, we're going to ask about, we're, we're going to improve that question next year. But, anyways, people are using some fancy tools in some cases, estimating all sorts of stuff. Most of that iteration planning effort is actually modeling. You're talking things through. You're going to the whiteboard. You're sketching things out. You're figuring out how you're going to build it. You're identifying the tasks. You're, you know, all of a sudden, some of that's modeling, some of that's planning. We need to make that more explicit. And so it's, it's strange. Yeah, we'll talk about planning constantly. I won't talk about the modeling aspects of it. And we model storm on a just-in-time basis. You know, you, know you, run into, you run into a problem. You know, what is that screen? What's that screen supposed to look like? Well, okay, let's put a whiteboard, sketch it out. Yeah, okay. And you spend the next couple days building it. It seems as if, you know, they're on this desert island. This is the way Mike Cohen likes to describe it. They're on this desert island, and they're this small co-located team, and Everybody's working together. They have a big group hug every morning. There's no legacy stuff. And everybody wants to be agile. And business stakeholders, you know, they're not going to force you to do a big estimate up front. You know, everything. We're no regulatory issues to worry about. Everything works out fine. Good for you if that's your situation. I've never actually seen that. The situations I get into, the team, you know, we got people on the team that spread out. Sometimes on the other side of the planet. Um, now that I'm with IBM, I'd be, I'd be hard pressed to find an IBM team that didn't have people on the other side of the planet, regardless of where the team actually thinks they are. Um, there's always somebody else somewhere else working on the team. There's always compliance issues, right? You got Sarbanes Ox in the States, FDA stuff, uh, Basel II, 